many of you are glad to have your sins forgiven? Have them washed away. I love you. When he washes our sins away, that means they are gone. What a great, great promise that is. Well, I forgot to do something. I don't want to, you know, I, no, I want to make sure that I had my phone on vibrate because if not, Michael will text me um, while, I'm, while, while I'm teaching. Tonight, we continue with our, uh, well, it may not just be Michael. It could be somebody else that texts me. I'm going to blame it on Michael anyway. I mean, he's supposed to be the one to get the blame, right? He'll probably text me and say, I didn't text you. Um, but I want to continue with the, to tell the truth. Tonight, I want to talk to you about a subject as important as anything that we'll ever cover. And, and of course, it's going to be going on our YouTube channel after service. And I, I'd love it for you to share it. The truth about eternity. The truth about eternity. And everything that we do in our lives, we need to keep eternity in mind. Uh, the greatest decisions that we make in our life, eternity has to be the heart of it. I'll take you to Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, it says this, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. To me, that last part of the verse right there, that last verse, number 15, is perhaps the most sobering verse in the Bible. What does it say there? It says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way for anyone. Because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, no one has to be without their name in the book of life. Um, but there is a truth about eternity. We live in a society that in many ways is pluralistic when it comes to gods. They, want to, they, they, have, they think there's many gods or many different ways. We live in a society that some don't believe that there is a God. Or we live in a society that thinks that uh, in, the human, in, in the humanist belief that, that, well, you're going to live this life and when it's over, it's over. And that's just not the case. In fact, it would be the saddest thing for, that, for all that we have is the 60 or 70 years that we have on this life. The, the fact is God has so much more for us. And the truth about eternity. So that tonight I want to share with you this. I wish I could go really deep into this. And in fact, I wish I could, could have separated it out. But, but I, I'm not going to separate it out because we're going to be moving into a different study. Um, dealing with, our, with, with mental health in the Bible due throughout the summer months. We need to get things right. Everybody needs to check themselves. No matter how you slice it, the fact remains that we are all eternal beings. Now, I don't know so much about all the animals and so forth. I know that a lot of people, you know, want to think that their dog is going to heaven. And you haven't met my dogs then. Um, you know, I, I don't know about those things. You know, I, I have definite beliefs. I, I have certain beliefs in this. And a lot of people think that when they get to heaven, they're going to fish in the crystal sea. I don't believe that because I don't believe there will be any death in heaven, according to Revelation 21. So I don't think we're going to be catching fish and eating them in heaven. So, um, so we're not going to be having death. But, but the reality is, for us as humans, God's favorite creation, eternity, is a reality. We are made, and we're made for our souls to be around forever. And, and that's important for us to understand. We have so many things that are that are pulling us in the world today, pulling the church, pulling people, pulling society, and, and pulling everyone in general. So many things pulling at us. I mean, we are as program-oriented as any people in the history of the world. 
And, and, and people look for programs to solve their problems, and programs will never solve spiritual problems. I'm not saying programs are bad, but programs won't do it. And if we're going to be honest about it, we focus way too much on material things, don't we? I mean, it's, it's real. I focus too much on material things. Most people focus too much on material things, things that really don't matter in the end. Things that, things that don't matter. I'm going to take you back. Almost four years ago, it was Wednesday night. We were in, Michael Allen was home from college. We were in Bible study. Dr. Tommy was teaching Bible study that night. I was running the sound. We were in the midst of the College World Series, and it was the finals of the College World Series, and Arkansas was playing Oregon State. We had won the first game the night before on Tuesday in that College World Series. And I'm not going to lie to you. I sat back there and doing what Michael was doing, and I was listening to Dr. Tommy, but I also had the game on my phone where I could keep up with the score like Michael's doing right now. And Philip. <laughs> and I was and I was keeping up with it. And it was all good. And then I get home from church that night and I'm watching Brother Ken the last couple innings of the game. I couldn't tell you what the score was, two, three to one, I'm not sure what it or, or two to one or three to two, something I'm not sure. And we get down to the in the ninth inning and we have two outs, two strikes on their team, one strike away from winning the College World Series. Never won the College World Series, the Razorbacks had it. Never won, never had. The, other, the only other time in 1979 they got to the finals and had a chance to win it and lost two games in a row and lost it, and here we are. We're at the finals, one out away, one strike away, and their batter fouls off a pitch. And it goes in, uh, into the right field foul territory. Our first baseman's running for the ball. Our right fielder's running for the ball, and he's got a beat on the ball. And our second baseman, who himself just endured a terrible tragedy in his personal life, our second baseman is running, and he runs into the middle of the guys, and the ball drops in between them. And then... The next pitch, the guy gets on. Then they hit a home run. They win the game. We lose the game. We lost that game. One strike, Brother, brother Don, away from winning the College World Series. And something I was going to get to watch after church. And oh man, this is what happened though. Then we lose the next game. But that night, I didn't sleep. That night I didn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. I tossed and I turned. I tried to sleep. I was miserable that night of a ball game. The next night, we lost the game. We couldn't do anything. We lost the game. The next night, we lost the World Series. What I did is I took every Razorback shirt that I owned. I put them all away. I took Hogville and I deleted the app from my phone. I went and I cleared all of my search engines on my computer where all my Razorback websites that I go to, I deleted every single one of them. And for one month, I didn't listen to the radio. I mourned that. It is. It's pitiful. It's pitiful. I mourned that. Every now and again, that picture, I still have that picture of the three guys and, and, you know, going for the ball and nobody getting it on my phone. And I, and I, remember, I think of that, and, and, and here it is. I realize when I look at that, I'm too materialistic. Because you see, as much as I want to think that, that God wants the Hogs to win, He probably could care less who wins a baseball game or a football game or a basketball game. And that's just material things. It's all right to enjoy those. And I'm so ashamed of myself for acting that way for a solid month. I wouldn't take texts from my Razorback friends that live out of state. But eternity's a reality. Eternity's a reality. Nearly nine out of ten people 
in the United States say that they believe in heaven, according to a recent ABC poll. But what exactly do people think when they think of the afterlife? What do they believe is required to get there? That's what we want to look at, is eternity being a reality. So I want to look at eternity is a reality. Everybody say eternity is a reality. In Isaiah chapter 57, let's look at the very beginning part of the verse. It says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth what? Eternity. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. The definition of eternity <clears throat> when it comes to dealing with life and the afterlife is simply this. Infinite time. There are some who believe that when life on this planet is over, it's over. There are some who believe that when death comes, so does the annihilation of everything you and I are. To me, there's nothing more morbid than believing that we are living these short years on the planet, that, that, and, and that's it. That if all I'm going to live on this planet, that's it, it's all over with. There's nothing more morbid than that. I mean, if, if, if we believe that, there's no reason to have church. There's no reason to gather together and worship God. There'd be no reason for that because if that was the case, what's the point, right? What is the point of it? There's no need for us to stay in church because we'd be wasting our time. The fact is, that point of view comes from the humanistic philosophy that the environment and this globe is more important than the creatures that God created. And that's what we are hearing these days is, oh, your environment and the globe is more important than the people in it. It's more important for us to say, and, and I don't want us destroying the environment. I, I don't think we should be terrible. I, I get aggravated when somebody pollutes and throws stuff out of their vehicle. I don't throw trash out of my vehicle. I, I, don't, I don't believe it. I like it. You know, I throw it in my office. Um, but, just kidding. Y'all didn't get that, did you? Um, I, you know, I, I don't think we should destroy our environment intentionally. But we need to understand the environment and the global nature of things is not more important than God's creation of man. It's not more important than that. You have to go back to man's creation in the Garden of Eden to truly begin to understand eternity. Man was created in the image of God. And because he was created in that manner, God intended for man to live how long? His intention was, was for man to live forever. His intention was not for man to die. We know the story. We know what happened. That man and woman, they sinned. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then they were disallowed from eating from the tree of life any longer. We're not able to eat of the tree of life until we ate of the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ now. And that's our tree of life. That's what brings us life for that eternity. But they understand that sin killed man. And we need to realize that. Sin killed man. And sin still does kill man. Because God created us to be eternal, then after sin, that made for there to be a choice for us. What is our choice? Our choice is to choose Jesus and what? What do we get if we get Jesus? What's the, what's the ultimate gift for Jesus? We get to go to heaven, right? We get eternity in paradise. We get eternity in the presence of the Lord. Or if we don't choose Jesus, it's eternity in hell. Either way, it's going to be eternity. I heard... Dr. Tony Evans shared this example many years ago, and, and it's still one of the most, I guess one of the most, one of the greatest examples I've ever heard given about eternity is this. How long is eternity? How long is eternity? And when I heard Dr. Tony Evans, he gave this probably 25 years ago, when I heard him share this, I thought, wow, I had never thought about it this way, but eternity would be this way. If you took, if, if you had one little sparrow, and one little sparrow was capable of every 10,000 years taking one speck of sand out of the Pacific Ocean and going and putting it every 10,000 years in a pile, one speck at a time. By the time that sparrow would take that, all the sand out of the ocean and build a mountain with that, and then you take that sparrow 
and once every 10,000 years take that speck of sand and put it back in the ocean and put it all back in the ocean. By the time he did all that, once every 10,000 years, one speck of sand at a time, if it was capable of doing that, by the time he finished his job, by taking it out and putting it back in again, it would be an amount of years that we could not calculate. But when he finished his job, eternity would just be beginning. That is the vastness of eternity. That is the power of eternity. That's how long we'll be in heaven. That's how long a person will be in hell. So, I want us to look at the truth. First, the truth about heaven. We often want to talk about our favorite place, but our favorite place should be planning for heaven, right? I love how Jesus described it in John. And this is how he described it in John. We could go into, I mean, I, I love how it's described, how, how the description is given in Revelation 21 of the new heaven and the new earth. I love that description, but I just want to describe it the way Jesus said it in John when he said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Contrary to popular belief, heaven is not a place reserved for the good people of the world. It's not reserved for the people who are good. It's not reserved for the people who are wealthy. It's not reserved for the people who are poor. Think about it for just a minute. What if we were to make value judgments on who to allow in heaven? Think about that. What if you were, what if you were in charge of determining how people got to heaven? So now you're just basically saying you do not want your son-in-law in heaven. Is that what she just did? Everybody hear that she said she doesn't want her son-in-law to make heaven. That's what I heard. That's exactly what, that's what came into my ears. I heard her say that. She needs to be praying and repenting right now because uh, some people may say there won't be any mother-in-laws in heaven. We don't want that, right? Okay. See, I've got the microphone. I can be just a little bit louder than you can. You see? All right. No, if we make value judgments, we would say, well, this person that's good, this person that they've done these wonderful things, this person that's gone and they've done these great deeds, that's how we would do it. But that's not the way God chooses for people to go to heaven. That's not how he did it. What could you do? What could you do that's good enough to get you to heaven? How good can you be that's good enough to get you to heaven? How many people can you help? How much money can you give away? How many old ladies can you walk across the crosswalk down Main Street? How many, how many people can you feed? Will it get you to heaven? Could you give away enough stuff? Could you do enough good deeds? Here's what Paul said. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You can do all the good in the world, but that would just be judged by us. We're going to judge that. So many people are looking for rewards on this planet. If I can just be citizen of the year, or if I can be Time Magazine's man of the year, or if I can, if I can, if I can be that person that gets that great reward so that everybody knows I did good. The reality is, I'm told in Scripture that I'm not supposed to let my left hand know what my right hand's doing. I'm not, we're not into this thing to get the applause of man. We want to satisfy God. We don't have the ability to proclaim someone to be fit or unfit for heaven, do we? Jesus had this same conversation in Mark chapter 10. You know the story. Yeah, I'm sure you know the story of, 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 of the rich man. And we, 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 we you know the story of the, the, the he, comes to, he comes to Jesus and, and what does he say? He says in, in Mark chapter 10, he says this, And when he had, was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit 
eternal life. Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good, no not one. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. He tells him all these things. And he said, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and, and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad saying that, 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 of that saying, and he went away grieved because he had great possessions. And then you know, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, look, he says, it's going to be hard for this rich man to enter heaven. He tells them it's going to be hard. He says, he says, it's impossible for the rich man to enter heaven. It's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven into the kingdom of God. And, 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 they, and they were astonished. They said, well, then who can be saved? But what did Jesus say to you? He said, Jesus looked up to them and he said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. You see, when Jesus was telling this guy to sell all his stuff, what he was saying is, is what you've got to do is you've got to sell out to me. You've got to give your life to me. And you've got to let me be. The, you know, I'm not, I'm not just your fire insurance. I want to have a relationship with you. You know, salvation is not just that, that, that thing where, where we're just trying to keep ourselves from burning. Salvation is us coming to the Lord realizing that we're sinners. But it's wanting us to be put back with God. They say it's not enough just to want to go to heaven. Because what's the point of going to heaven if we're not going there to be with him? Right? That's not what it's about. It's about building that relationship. It's about having that with him. Heaven is the place that's being prepared for us, not as, a, not as just a place to keep us out of hell, but a place to keep us with God. Because the greatest part that sin played was it separated man from God. But what did Jesus do? He came to take man and put him back to God. To put to, to reconcile that. See, heaven is that place that's prepared for those who are saved and know Jesus Christ personally as their Lord and Savior. It is that place of paradise described by John in Revelation 21 that Jesus has gone to prepare for those who are saved. And this is it. Only the saved will enter heaven. Heaven is for people who have come to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I know for other religions that may sound narrow-minded to them that we believe it this way, but we believe the truth. We're talking about the truth. And of all the religions in this world, only one has grace as its redemption favor for our lives. And, 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 and that's what we have. Only one requires your name to be put in the Lamb's book of life, and that is through salvation in Jesus Christ. The good aren't going to make it. The rich aren't going to make it. The poor aren't going to make it. The famous aren't going to make it. And I'm not meaning that none of them are going to make it, but they're not going to make it because of that. The only way someone's going to go to heaven, which is prepared for the saved, is for them to have Jesus Christ. That's it. Then, if eternity's a reality, we can't talk about heaven and miss out on reminding people about hell. Hell is real. It's just as real as heaven. Hell is the home made for the devil and his followers. And the sad part is this, which is enlarging with humans. Did you know hell is not enlarging with the devil and his followers that were cast out? That was a set amount of, that was a set amount. That didn't increase. Hell is enlarging by humans who refuse to come to Jesus. Look at Isaiah chapter 5. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it. 
Matthew 25. It says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, What does he say? Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for who? The devil and his angels. The fact is, and we need to understand this, and I know you understand it, and I know I'm preaching and teaching to the choir tonight, but the fact is that hell was not built for me. It was not built for you. And we should never take any joy in someone going to hell. We should grieve if somebody goes to hell. We should, we, 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 you know, I can't think of anybody as, as bad as circumstances are, as bad as crime is. I don't want the worst criminal to go to hell. I'm not the one, I'm not the one to judge them. I'm not saying I don't want criminals to pay for for their um, for, for for their for for their evil deeds. I'm not saying that. But I, I you know Ted Bundy, Ted Bundy, a guy who killed thirty innocent women on college campuses throughout America. Ted Bundy who was on death row. A godly man named Dr. James Dobson went and shared with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Ted Bundy gave his heart to the Lord. Now, this guy who killed 30 young ladies, this guy who, who had a terrible, terrible penchant for violence when it comes to women, has been put to death on this earth, but brought back to life in Christ. That is God's mercy. That is God's mercy. And I'm glad that there was somebody like Dr. James Dobson who said, you know what? This guy's soul is worth it. His soul is worth it. When most people had given up on, on somebody like that. This is one of the saddest cr truths of Scripture about hell. God never intended for His favorite creation to spend one day in hell. He never intended for one human to go to hell. That was never God's thought and never God's choice. He left that choice up to man. He leaves that choice up to you and to me. The fact of the matter is, no one spends an eternity in the most despicable place unless they have simply this, and it's this simple, unless they've rejected Christ. That's it. There are so many things that we could use to describe hell, but I have to describe it as a place that men and women without Christ are headed as uninvited inhabitants. The truth is that regardless of some who believe hell is to be some believe hell to be symbolic, or hell to be on this earth, and Jehovah's Witnesses teach that, and that, that, that and teach that, that. Well, you know, Lord, listen. If you think things are bad here, folks, don't you think that this is hell on earth? Because it's no such way. We should never even describe earth in that form or that fashion, because it's not that way. Here's just a short description of the torments of hell. How it would be it would be this. At 2,000 degrees, fire will incinerate human flesh in mere seconds. The core of our, our, of our earth is believed to be as hot as six times what it takes to incinerate human flesh. Just imagine being in the heat that is 12,000 degrees for any amount of time. The problem with that is not just heat, but rather the fact that the inhabitants of hell will be incinerated not once, but for eternity. And whatever heat it may be, they're not going to be incinerated once, but for eternity. They will feel it every time because it becomes a place of torment. Total exhaustion. Emotional, emotional, mental, physical trauma. No sleeping in hell. No naps in hell. For those of you who like to take a nap a day. You are alone from any human contact. See, God didn't intend for man to be alone, but he'll be separated from every other man. Eternity is a reality. And the truth is, it was not made for us. There are so many truths of heaven or of hell and the torments 
there that God, I believe, has sent words, warnings, visions, near-death experiences just to persuade us along with His Scriptures that we don't want to chance it. We don't want to chance going to hell. Why would anybody want the chance going to hell? If they're 8, 18, 80, however age, would you even want a chance going to hell? Not any sane person would want to chance it. People should not ever take the chance with their soul. For those who would be watching online later on, maybe I would say it this way. You need to make your decision. Either salvation through Jesus Christ that takes you to heaven or damnation which will take you to hell. A person who would, who would decide to turn their back and not take Jesus Christ is playing Russian roulette with their very soul. The reality of eternity is for every one of us. People may look at how eternity begins. Some think maybe eternity begins for us at conception and maybe that's so. I want to make it more, a little bit simpler for us. You will begin eternity either through the grave or through the rapture. What I've learned and while I still consider Utah a short life, I still consider myself young until I look in the mirror. And this, in the short 52 years that I've had on this life, what I have learned is this. In preaching some 250 funerals since I've been a pastor, what I have learned is this, is that death comes for most people unexpectedly. But death does come. Death does come for people. Every one of us, Jesus said in the scriptures, he said, take heed. Talking about for us to understand that we need to take heed, take note, be prepared ourselves because of that. We are going to face eternity. I, I, you know, um, I, I've been preaching it for years. I believe in the rapture of the church. I don't know the day or the hour when the rapture is going to take place. I absolutely believe in the rapture. But if the rapture doesn't take place before I breathe my last breath, Brother Eddie, at some point in time, I'm going to enter eternity. I'm either going to enter eternity by the grave or I'm going to enter it through the trumpet sound of the rapture. Now here's the thing. We only have two choices where to go. How many of you like to go on vacation from time to time and go places? You know, when you go places, what do you like to do? You like to go and you go to hotels.com or Priceline or something. Me, I go to Choice. I, I don't like those other places. I, 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 I'm, I'm a person of routine. And, and so I like to get my choice points and, 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 and so forth. So I, I like to do that. And so what I do is I go online and I check out where where it is that I can go, what, 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 what place I can go and stay. And, I, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll look to, to um, find a, a hotel and I'll go through many choices. And several years ago, we were getting ready to go to General Assembly in San Antonio. And I had gone through as in 2008. I wasn't your pastor at this time. I'm not quite as cheap as I was then. But, um, and, and so Brother Ken, I go through Choice Hotels and I found what I thought was gonna be a really good hotel. Hey, if you're going to San Antonio, do not stay at this place, all right? Do not stay at this place. If the pictures online look great, but I looked at a bunch of them, all the other hotels because of General Assembly were jacked up, prices real high. And I said, I'm not going through convention services for that. I'm gonna find my own hotel. And I found a roadway in for $60 a night. I said, I've got these guys beat, man. All these other preachers, they're paying $140 a night, $150 a night. And I said, I got it for $60. We'd driven all the way, got, got to San Antonio. My friend Patrick Tucker, the pastor at Mark Tree, was following us. And we pull into the roadway in, and he starts laughing. He was behind us. He starts laughing, and he says, you just put the road kill him. <laughs> oh, I looked in there and 
I'd already booked the room and I was past the point of being able to cancel it. And I, 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 Michael Allen went inside and I looked at it and, and we were, I, we, they, the rest of the family was scared to get in. And Tanya said, I'm not getting out here. And I went in and I said, folks, I said, I'm getting out of this. They said, well, you got to pay for one night. I said, I'm paying for one night out of my pocket. I said, I, and I mean, I, I, I'm going my, I, I'm, I'm, I'm calling up and getting another reservation miles down the road because I had choices of hotels and I decided to go to the Road Kill Inn, not the Road Way Inn. Do not go to Road Way Inn in San Antonio. I just want to tell you, don't stay there. There's a Comfort Inn and Suites down the road. It costs a little bit more, but I had choices. But I had bunches of hotels. I could have stayed at the Hilton, the Hyatt, the Marriott. And I made the wrong choice. But when it comes to eternity, we don't have 40 different choices like Priceline or Hotels.com. We have two choices. We can choose heaven with Jesus Christ. Or we can choose hell without it. That's the truth about eternity. And we need to all, always check what our choice is. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, dear God, for your word and the truth, dear God, of your word. Lord, it's, it's so powerful and so incredible, dear Lord, to us. God, we thank you, dear God, for the choice of Jesus Christ that we can go to heaven and be in your presence forever and ever and ever. God, I pray, dear Lord, that this would touch people who are watching online, that maybe, dear Lord, it might help some of them to, to come to know you as their Lord and as their Savior. God, we know that there's only one way, and that's you, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. And we appreciate you guys. You have a great, great rest of the week. Don't forget, get somebody here with you for the crawfish bowl.